Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the Give Your Pixie Wings dis uh, presentation. It's actually one of two parts. This one, we're gonna talk about the basics of how Pixie works, and the second part, we're gonna go into alternatives and other ways to get provisioning done. So uh, if you're advanced, jump ahead. Otherwise, hang on, we are, we've got a lot of material to cover. This is based on a talk that I gave for SRECon, uh, but uh, this is going to be RackN focused, and we're going to talk about RackN and how RackN does these things. So as your host, uh, I want to guide you through what is going on with Pixie Provision. It is absolutely essential to RackN and RackN customers and people who are using Digital Rebar to handle provisioning. Uh, Digital Rebar is a distributed infrastructure as code management platform, uh, which means that we're helping people run data centers better. That's, that's what we do. A core and essential part of that is digital rebar provision, which is our provisioning abstraction layer. So it handles per Pixie on bare metal, really on any infrastructure that you can throw at it um, using a variety of techniques. In this talk, we're going to be deeply focused on the Pixie bare metal boot process. Um, but everything I'm showing you can be applied more generally to other types of infrastructure also. So let's dig in. In concept, provisioning is super, super easy. All we're trying to do is put an operating system onto a computer. It could be a switch, it could be a server, it really doesn't matter. Um, and and con while it's conceptually easy, it's actually really, really hard. And it's really hard because we have to deal with bootstrapping, which is literally starting a system up from nothing. Um, it's supposed to be hard, so you have to have a process to do that. And the first parts of this process are gonna be fragile. Firmware limitations on servers, um, you know, you can only do what the server is able to do uh, and then work around it. And these are variations, right? When we're talking to customers at RackN, they're dealing with different types of servers, different vendors, different protocols. Some of them are using old legacy BIOS. Some of them are using UEFI BIOS. Some of them are turning it off altogether. Some of them are using Redfish. Some of them are using vendor. It is crazy heterogeneous, and that's okay. We have ways to cope with all that, but that's what makes it hard. That's why we spend a lot of time doing what we're doing. That's why it's very hard to just take a TFTP server and a DHCP server and build a real provisioning infrastructure. And we'll explain that. Networking is always hard. Networking is networking. Security, it, we're going to talk about Secure Boot in Section 2. Um, important, critical. You need to think about it. Um, these systems, especially as we get to edge and there's zero trust, have to be done right. Um, and then provisioning is not complete if you don't do post configuration. Uh, you can't have 100 copies of the exact same thing. Every machine has to have an identity and logins and credentials and IP addresses that are right and, and applications installed that are working correctly. So there's a lot to think about. And th that's what this talk is going to cover. It's not even going to go into things that RackN spends a lot of time helping customers do that are also super important to getting your data center and your infrastructure running well. So, you know, as you think about this, we have yes answers to how do I actually know what my system's configured at? Can I fix it and validate that it's the thing that is there is what I think it is, that it didn't lose some DIMMs or a machine a drive failed or somebody cabled it wrong? All those things are absolutely essential to good operational process. Um, and we can help you. Uh, hardware configuration, RAID and BIOS, RAID and BIOS out of band management. Um, also, you know, as, uh, getting your, your BIOS flashed even on your NIC cards or your RAID controllers, absolutely essential. Not covered in this talk. Um, things that we're happy to talk about is RackN, um, but deep. Uh, and, and you need to get this other provisioning pieces right before you go there. Naming and address and credentials injection, all absolutely can't run infrastructure if you don't get all of these things right. And I'm sorry, there's no hall pass of worry about only a little bit of it. You got to get it all right. The good news is we spend a lot of time helping customers get it all right. And we have out of the box stuff that handles most all of this. So it's nice in, in this talk, since it's rack end, I can tell you, yes, we do that. We try to make it easy. We do it all as infrastructure as code. Check this out, check it out. It's, it's really powerful, but I get there. Let me teach you a little bit about how all this stuff works. So exploring provisioning. Basically, most people, when they think of Pixie, they use it as a proxy for NetBoot. Net, uh, you'll hear Pixie, iPixie, Oni, 
ONIE, which is for switching, kickstart, pre-seed, all very common. That's the first part of this talk. Uh, image deploy and esoteric flavors are in the second talk, a whole new, whole new section. We'll talk about Packer, um, writing boot partitions, cloud init, KExec, secure boot, BMC. Uh, we'll add in Raspberry Pi as a special addendum into this. Um, bring you up to speed on all of this stuff. Those are critically important uh, because really the basics are great. Uh, most of our customers are really working to get into these more advanced, faster, more robust and resilient uh, provisioning styles. So part two, but bear with me. All of these things actually lead to uh, kernel init process. So no matter what we're doing, at some point you're bootstrapping the kernel uh, kickstart, pre-seed, um, weasel, uh, Windows has a, has a netboot partition. Um, I'm going to call it kickstart just to keep things simple. That's the Red Hat CentOS way to do it. Um, but it's the same concept. It's a kernel initialization, kernel init uh, process that we have to get to. Once we've got to that, the road gets less bumpy, but that's where we got to be. And there's challenges after. Uh, this is our internal, uh, what we show to customers when they start asking really hard questions and their network teams get involved. We have a series of these. This is one of, I think, seven or eight um, uh, swim lane charts that show all of the process and pieces of how uh, provisioning flows with documentation and things like that. That's my, way too much of an eye chart for this, so don't try to read it at the moment. Um, and then over here, this is the, the, the streamlined uh, version of it. Uh, still an eye chart where we actually walk through all the things that digital rebar goes back and forth and hands off during the provisioning process. Super important also, we have a whole bunch of training materials on that too. Um, we're not there yet. Before we go further, I do want to show you what this process actually looks like. Uh, so this is a Pixie boot running in a virtual machine to our in-memory OS called Sledgehammer, which is super optimized to go quickly. I just started the OS running. It's going to DC DHCP. It's going to pick up iPixie Linux. Uh, hi, Peter Alvin. We see his name all the time. Loading stage one and stage two of those and doing the kernel init to load Sledgehammer. Um, this is highly optimized. It runs in memory. It doesn't have to do a lot of the normal kickstart. And so it completes uh, really quickly. Even so, you can see there's a ton of things getting set and updated, um, turning on SSH daemons and things like that to actually get the system going to get to a command line prompt. That is a full provisioning process. Um, we're going to start much simpler with some, some big animal pictures because you need to understand this first anyway. Bootstrapping is a multi-stage process. So let's look at each one. The first thing a server has to do in this process is just get on the network. So firmware on the server called PXE, um, often embedded in the NIC card controller, um, will get on the network. So it'll use a DHCP, Dynamic Host Discovery Protocol or uh, Control Protocol, uh, to get an IP address. That protocol has a whole bunch of options baked into it. It's UDP, um, which means it's just sending datagram packets. It's not a TCP service, so you don't have to have a lot of the other infrastructure you'd need. It sends back a next server instruction, which is telling it where to find the next uh, bootstrapping instructions, and some options like gateways and its IP address and, and all sorts of information. Um, Digital Rebar has a lot of control over those instructions. We build in a DHCP server. It's not required, but we highly recommend using it um, because we control this process and then feed it forward into the rest of the provisioning operations for you. But no matter how you're doing it, you need to have DHCP respond with some next server instruction to that, that initial Pixie bootloader. From there, it's going to download LPixie Linux or some other bootloader, usually LPixie Linux, um, that is going to get the system started. So that's what we call a stage one bootloader. Um, it's a really small amount of code, but it's enough to actually have a real uh, network stack, really start um, doing regular provisioning operations. The Pixie is just smart enough to download that one program and start it. Once you've started that program, you can get a better bootloader. Um, stage two, our stage two bootloader, um, it will bring in an iPixie EFI file, will actually have some real operational pieces for it, can switch to HTTP or better HTTPS to then start bringing down the process. We do that because it's much faster. 
um, much more controlled, it's more secure. Um, the faster you get out of that first stage bootloader, the better. And so we, we split this up into two, sta two stage bootloaders. We were really early doing this. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, but it's getting to be pretty common practice to do this two stage bootloader. Or if you have a modern system and you're using the latest BIOS, just switch into a iPixie bootloader and you can skip that first um, uh, bootload, uh, Pixie bootload and, and jump right to this step. Doesn't save you that much time, but it's more secure. And then uh, finally, once you've gotten to that bootloader, then you can go in and get a real kernel, right? Transition to doing that kernel in it and a kick, an actual kickstart pro process. And we'll, we'll talk more about what that looks like uh, as we go. Um, but the thing to keep in mind here is that this is actually four operating systems that you've started. Every one of these stages is really a new operating system. You might not think of it like an operating system, but that's what it is. And so it's going through this process. It actually generates DHCP requests each time this happens. Um, new leases, potentially, you have to have a system that's, uh, that understands that each one of these boots is not a completely new operating system because they're going to come in without, without having the lease, without knowing what's happened before it. Um, and walk through this. But the bootstrap process is, and it's helpful to think of it this way, is actually um, staging through multiple operating systems, getting to a more and more complex operating system until you finally have ta -da, your Linux or Windows or VMware kernel um, that, you're, that you're actually going to start being able to build on top of. And like I said, you can skip that, that one of those kernels, but you're only getting so far in this. Um, and the funny thing is, is that at that point, you're really not doing Pixie anymore. You're doing iPixie, but everybody just calls it Pixie. So when you say Pixie, people think provision um, and they're, they're pretty much equivalent. Okay. So now that we've gone through that, I do want to show you what that whole kickstart process looks like. I'm about to run a CentOS install, just a regular one um, out of our, out of our system and start that boot process. So we're going to take that same machine and let it run through the process. And what you'll see here is uh, it's going through this exact same kickstart precede or uh, uh, first stage, second stage bootloaders. But in this case, it's then going to start the CentOS uh, bootloader. So you'll see this is CentOS instead of Sledgehammer. It's doing its init RD which, and then running our initialized system. It's very similar. Uh, Sledgehammer is actually based on CentOS, so you'll see a lot of the same scroll, but then it will switch into uh, a system process that is going to be much slower. This is where it actually starts the Anaconda, which is the kickstart process to install the whole OS. And it's going to take a while to go do all these things. And this is with external libraries turned off, so it's not even trying to drag things over the uh, internet installer. So this is Anaconda. Um, and walking now through the whole install process. Um, and you can see there's quite a bit of uh, bits and pieces to this. So the magic of time lapse has meant that you didn't have to sit through the five minutes uh, that I just did waiting for this uh, to complete. And not only did it have to do the full install, then it did a reboot on top of that. So now we're watching it reboot from the, the disk to install the operating system. So this is not, this is a paint drying process, um, but you have to do it. This is how operating systems get installed and what they actually look like when they go. So you just got to watch CentOS being installed in just five minutes, which all things considered is pretty darn fast. Whew, that's it. Now you understand everything you need to know about Pixie booting, right? Uh, sadly, no. Um, provisioning is much more than Pixie, as I've been saying. Um, all we're doing when we get to a Pixie or an iPixie system is we're just getting that kernel loaded. Once that kernel is loaded, we still have a long, long road in front of us. So from there, we actually have to do a kickstart, right? Once again, precede, weasel, whatever else you're going to do. Um, we call it precede um, or kickseed uh, as a hybrid inside of uh, digital rebar. You'll see that in some of our templates. Um, 
and then from there what you'll what you'll actually get is configuration templates so the challenge with kickstart is that even though it's smarter than pixie it actually needs to know what the system is that it's installing to. It needs to know the NIC, NIC drivers, NIC configurations. It's trying to turn on advanced functions. It needs to know the storage configurations that are there. Um, it needs to know what, what output console to use, right? Is it is it using serial out on one, two, three? Is it, you do you care about USB drives? All that stuff that's configured in your system, you need to know about, right? If you're trying to use um, some add-on NIC cards instead of the baseboard ones, you have to program those. That's what the Kickstart system is gonna do. It goes through all that process just to get a real operating system with real IO started. Um, once again, Digital Rebar has a whole bunch of templates. We call them boot ems, where we influence this whole process and, and help make it go. Um, everything I'm showing you is really what's in the boot -em process. Uh, and it's complex. It's the most complex thing about Digital Rebar. And yet, we've done it for you. So for the most part, you'll be able to take uh, boot ems that already exist, apply them into the system, and never learn how they work behind the scenes. Isn't that nice? Uh, some people, you will find yourself digging into boot ems and will help you. But for the most part, our out-of-the-shelf out works, off-the-shelf stuff works. It's been battle-hardened and tried and tested for years um, and that's a good thing so after that then you actually start doing uh, operating system installation in earnest um, you're not out of the woods you actually have to download a whole bunch of packages and install the things and pieces that you need and still after that then you have to start doing things like getting your credentials and apps and access you have to set up passwords and name the systems and get on the right networks that you want to get on all that's in post config so a lot of steps have to be have to happen here um, and that's really important so when we look at this process that's these configuration templates that we have going on um, one of the things to note in this is that when we're talking about the system as a whole the ISOs are minimal and they're actually pretty stale so when we take an ISO which is an operating system image uh, set up people don't put everything that's that they need in there uh, a lot of the vendors especially canonical um, really makes that a very minimal set and they assume that you're going to start downloading packages with an internet connection off of their repos and mirrors and it's going to start slurping those things down that's going to be slow it's going to be painful if you have a real firewall or a proxy server things like that this might not work at all you might have to have local mirrors you probably security policy requires you to have local mirrors we have, we have ways to encounter all those things, but that's the next step here. Um, you're, it's going to have to be done either way. Um, even if you just start using Sledgehammer, you're going to you're gonna need additional packages. Sledgehammer is our, um, we'll talk about it, it's our, it's our way of doing this process in a very minimal way that you can get running pretty much on any system ever. Um, we've been really careful about that. And then once you're done, then you start doing post-configuration operations and making all the rest of the process um, run through. And what Digital Rebar is really about, ultimately, is connecting all these steps together. So when we go to automate it, um, what we're building is a workflow that makes all of these pieces fit together very cleanly. Um, and that, that's really important for provisioning. Just installing an OS or you know, just putting an image out there is not provisioning, in our opinion. It's, it's really just installing an OS. Provisioning means getting a system ready to roll. Right. When we think of, if you go all the way back to the original meaning of provisioning, which would be packing your wagon for a trip uh, and getting everything you need to, to be successful, uh, you have to have everything in the wagon. Um, and that's, that's what provisioning is to us. That's, that's how we approach uh, solving these problems. And for us, it's actually packing a whole caravan because you have to have all the wagons working together. Sometimes you got to figure out what goes in each wagon, and that's part of Digital Rebirth's magic. And we do that with infrastructure is code so everything we're building is all in our code repositories it's all locked you don't twiddle the bits um, you might influence things with a pro profile um, that's by design but for the most part it's it's infrastructure is code it's versioned it's managed um, and that's important and the other thing that that you have to do to do this well and, and we do a lot of is out of band management so this is a great process netboot go all the way through but if you're managing the system on an ongoing basis, you also need to manage it out of band, which means power cycle, remote consoles, BMC, uh, 
there's tons of different protocols. Redfish is becoming more popular, but it's not universal. It's not actually common across all vendors. Um, there's advanced features that pop in there and you have to figure all this stuff out. So part of what Digital Rebar is able to do is not just do this uh, kickstart pre-seed type template net boot. We also then do processes that include out-of-band management so that you can cycle machines. Um, in section two, we'll talk about some advanced things that use media attach out of, out of BMCs to boot machines. Um, a lot of ways to use out-of-band management. And you need to, if you're in a data center or an edge, uh, out-of-band management is your way to assert final control of the systems, uh, especially if you've lost or, or you're a service provider and you've given up control of that system, out-of-band management is your uh, backdoor to get back into and control the system, shut it down, tell it to reboot and reflash everything and you're, you're good to go again. So very important components in the whole overall provisioning workflows and pieces. And so I've been talking about this. Let me actually show you what some uh, provisioning templates look like. So before we go further, I wanna show you what these provisioning templates look like. Uh, this is a view in Digital Rebar's UX uh, that is new. So if you're an old user, this is great new functionality that we've, we've brought in in the 4.6 release timeframe. Um, and what you'll see here is these are all the content packs. I'm just going to go into the primary content pack, uh, the community content, and we're going to look at some of the bootems, which is where this provisioning uh, template pieces work. And if I look at one of our standard uh, ones, let me start with Sledgehammer. Looking at the raw object, what you'll see is um, all sorts of parameters that get injected into the system at boot time. Uh, you'll see templates that we have that actually go through and you know, do different actions uh, of bringing up the system, set the path for TFTP boot, um, and then actually we'll start, this is Raspberry Pi configuration file, uh, that unique thing, uh, inject different addresses. So what we've done here is we've created a standard set of best practices around boot provision. Uh, if you look at our one for CentOS 8, um, you'll see something very similar. Here's a whole bunch of standard templates that get pulled in. We can I can show you those. We'll find them in just a minute. Uh, optional parameters that get injected, different loaders that are necessary. If I come down into the templates, I can start looking at here's the CentOS 8 Kickstart. And once again, this is a standard Kickstart, but the benefit here is that we've actually standardized all these pieces, parameterized them, we've taken a lot of the headaches out. So if you are building and setting these variables, they should work across different operating systems where appropriate, where they don't, you're gonna be able to do your own. This is why we did something called Kickseed, so that we can standardize the Debian Ubuntu and CentOS RHEL families. Um, and this is true universally, but it, this is deep detailed stuff. Um, go to the good Digital Rebar um, content repos, check out some of the things we're doing. Um, but there's a lot going on here. And that is the point of this talk, is for you to sort of see just how much actually goes into every single step of building a provisioning operation. So I hope that was helpful to show you some of the pieces and parts um, that actually go into building digital rebar templates. Before we end this section, I do wanna give you some idea of questions that we normally get uh, for digital rebar, and then this will serve as a good starting point for the next section. I, I hope this has really answered some of your key questions. Three, two. So I hope that seeing some digital rebar templates was helpful for you. Um, a lot of thought goes into how these things are built. Um, just digital rebar, uh, Golang templates, um, you know, take some getting used to. We're, we're doing variable substitution. We're really pulling data in from an infrastructure as code perspective. Um, but it's a really good investment because when you're building systems using the data you have, they're much more resilient. You can go a lot faster and you can actually make systems that account for how the reality of your data center is. That, that's really what Digital Rebar is about. Uh, as we conclude section one of this talk, I do wanna go through what typical questions are. 
Um, we do see the same questions over and over again, and, and they're smart questions, right? Why is this so fragile? I, I really spent a lot of time trying to explain how provisioning gets to be so fragile, right? Bootstrapping is complex. It's hard. You're relying on firmware that uh, might have been written before you started your IT career. Um, and so these are these are systems that have worked this way for a long time, and they, they have to be care and fed, and, and that's just the way IT is in some cases. Um, but, you know, understanding it helps you build resiliency into your system. Um, we do see people who want to do uh, Pixie over Wi-Fi all the time, um, or think about it. Wi-Fi requires credentials before you get on the network. It's not an unsecured network. Um, or if it is, secure your network. <laughs> um, so it doesn't really work from a bootstrapping perspective. If, if you're injecting information in before you've Pixie booted, you've defeated the purpose of Pixie. Um, you could probably do it. You could probably throw these images over the wire. It's not really what we'd recommend um, from, from that perspective. So most Pixie is wired network. Um, VLAN comes up all the time. Um, you know, these are these are BIOSes. They're pretty simple. They don't understand VLANing um, as a starting point. You can do it. There are ways, especially if you're using UEFI or advanced uh, like iPixie, you you can VLAN tag. Um, if you do want VLANs, what we see happening is uh, either you do it at the switch and you're not exposing it at the the system itself. You're just handling it at trunking at the switch, or what you're doing is you're switching in and out. So we've had customers who will um, leave their switches in a VLAN zero, uh, untagged VLAN for this boot provision. And as soon as that process is completed, they use automation triggered out of digital rebar to then put you into a VLAN and turn off that trunking. It's a little bit riskier because you might be in a situation where you, you're not able to pixie boot because that, that uh, traffic can't be forwarded but it addresses people's security. So you create a small window and then you get off of that window as fast as possible. Um, which, you know, that's sometimes that's how security is. There's a small insecure window and then you move out of it as fast as you possibly can. And we do a whole bunch of work to help people minimize their exposure um, from those perspectives. Uh, people want to know about containerizing digital rebar or the whole process. Uh, yes, we help customers do that all the time. We don't actually recommend it uh, as a first thing because this is UDP. DHCP, TFTP require um, datagrams, not TCP, which isn't as friendly with Docker. Um, and so you end up having to be very careful about how you configure and give security to those containers. So it does work, um, but if you don't need it, uh, don't just add it for the, the glory of containerizing things. Um, you know, but if that's your process, definitely will help you. You can make it work. Uh, setting BIOS and RAID. Oh yes, that's multiple hours of presentations about this. Ultimately, it's you know not that bad. We we run tools to set RAID and BIOS and a whole bunch of profiles and configurations. Um, definitely doable. But that is not Pixie. Uh, it's really actually not even provisioning. It is it is a system lifecycle configuration uh, utility. We tend to prefer to do it in band, meaning from, from our Sledgehammer boot OS, we then do run the tools to do RAID and BIOS configuration, um, as opposed to setting things out of band. We do also do out of band configuration using Redfish or the vendor specific iDRAC, ILO, whatever uh, protocols. Um, but those don't scale as well when you have to do hundreds of systems in parallel, and they don't give you as much feedback as we get when we do it in band. So. Um, a lot of different ways to skin that cat. Uh, love to talk about it um, and help you make yourself not have to learn how to do it because there's not a lot of profit in learning how to set BIOS. Um, not at least for our customers. They want to get it done, make it reliable, and move to a more important uh, business challenge. And then finally, how can I make this whole stuff faster? Because right, what I'm showing you is not particularly fast, especially if you're booting a machine and you're waiting for it to post BIOS, um, you know, can you improve your end-to-end -end performance? Because a lot of people spend a lot of time waiting for servers to get provisioned, and we get it. That is your tie-in for session two, so that we can talk about uh, this more in depth. Um, we're going to cover those topics and more, so please check out uh, section two of this talk. I hope this has been helpful. If you have questions, please, please 
come ask us, uh, join the Rack and Slack, um, or email us, send us a postcard um, or a ferry with a you know, embedded in a paper airplane. We'd love to hear from you, talk about this stuff. Thanks a lot. This has been Rob Hirschfeld with Rack N. See you in the next presentation.